It's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the third of this year's Clark Kerr Lecture Series. We've had the first two lectures last week, and there will be a summary lecture on another campus in San Diego on Friday, for those of you who like to travel, not on Friday, on Thursday, for those of you who like to travel. I will remind you that the Clark Kerr Lectures, which have been around since 2001, are uh, created to recognize Clark Kerr and his contributions to the university and to American higher education, and for that matter, to the Carnegie Commission, where he was after he left the presidency. Uh, the lectures are jointly supported by the UC Office of the President and by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Our lecturer this year, still, is Simon Morganson of the Institute of, Educa of Higher Education in London and formerly of the University of Melbourne. He has been talking to us about the California model of higher education, uh, globalization, and now for this third lecture we have the topic, as you can see, bonfire of the publics. So jump on, and uh, re the, after the question mark comes rebuilding the social foundations of higher education. Simon. Well, thank you sincerely uh, for coming to the third Clark Kerr lecture, and thanks especially to those who have lasted their way through the series. It's a, a noble contribution to the art of listening. Um, and I hope that we'll have the chance to have more dialogue this time at the end of the lecture. Um, I'm very fortunate in your participation and this lecture series and my visit uh, have been associated with many conversations uh, in which I've learned a great deal in a short time. And I want to thank you also for welcoming Anna and Sasha as well as myself. Um, I'm very grateful to Judd uh, for his generous organisation and to, to his invaluable briefings and to his kindness. Um, thank you again to Christina um, for her kindness and material help and uh, also to Diana and I, I think I should add my thanks also to the UC Office of the President and to the Carnegie Corporation for their sponsorship of the series. In the first lecture I, re I reflected on Clark Kerr and the 1960 Master Plan and on the, on the ideas of Kerr and Martin Trow and Bob Clark and I discussed what I call the distinctive Californian model of higher education a system that serves the state and its people, expands its need, providing access to all, combines mass education with excellence on the basis of diverse provision, and is, is crowned by the large research multiversity with its many missions. The Californian model of public higher education now has its problems, but the historic achievements stand. The second lecture looked at the passage of those Californian ideas beyond California. No other systems look exactly the same as California. Other ideas about higher education are also influential, particularly from Europe. And in some other countries, public education also has policy problems, as it does here. Nevertheless, key features of the California model have appeared across the world. The open-ended growth of participation in higher education has swung from being an extreme and an unusual case in California to becoming the norm of almost every tertiary education system in the world. The multiversity, the comprehensive university speaking the language of global science and many nations, though not all, separate sectors of higher education institutions with different missions. In some countries, mass expansion is largely carried by public institutions. In others, largely by private institutions, including for profits. However, in every nation outside the United States, the leading research universities are in the public or national sector. It's the UC Berkeley variant of the multiversity and not the Harvard or Stanford variant that has gone global. This is because of the strategic importance of research to states and its cost, and because no other country has alumni giving and philanthropy on the American scale to support a front rank private research university. Even the strong private universities we find in Japan and Korea, Brazil, are overshadowed by the status and performance of the top national universities in those countries. Now today I explore further issues and problems of public higher education inside and outside California. 
Public higher education carries a broad potential for modernisation of a democratic kind. Clark Kerr and the Master Plan achieve some of that potential, which is why we still talk about them, I think. But Californian higher education is ruled not only by the 1960 Master Plan, but also by the anti-tax Proposition 13 of 1978. The very idea of public or common benefits orchestrated by states is continually under fire from heavy ideological guns. It's a mantra. Private good, public bad. Competition good, cooperation bad. Markets good, public planning bad. In this setting, state fiscal policy has become profoundly dysfunctional and it's been impossible to develop the master plan in line with changing needs. Will California allow the California model to go up in smoke? What might be the basis for a forward move to advance the plan's twin principles of access and excellence? It's impossible to consider this without looking at the deeper underlying issues that shape the context of higher education. As an Australian citizen based in UK Europe, I, I do not have Californian answers. But some of those underlying issues also play out in the UK and in Australia too. Today I'm going to proceed in three parts. First, I'll discuss how Californian higher education is travelling, commenting on aspects of the multiversity, the CSU and community colleges, and I'll briefly consider what a renovated master plan might look like in the best of all possible worlds. This could not become a live possibility without a change in the political climate. Secondly, I move to the obstacles that block a renewal of the plan, the um, politics of increasing inequality, the financial barriers for poor, poor families, the doctrinaire preference for competition and market actors, always, the narrow ideas about the benefits of higher education. Third, I propose some ways and means of regrounding higher education as a shared public enterprise. These suggestions are diverse, but they're all designed to broaden social inclusion and enhance individual and collective outcomes. I'll discuss tuition loans, uh, student learning, and approaches to the public benefits of higher education. Well, how is public higher education travelling? How indeed? It's a mixed picture, as you can see. Worldwide, social participation in higher education is advancing rapidly. The number of research-intensive universities grows. The partial exception to the advance of participation is the United States. And socio-ethnic economic stratification, the low value of some forms of participation, tuition costs block the advance of higher education, especially the advance of degree completion numbers. However, in all countries, public higher education is a mix of pluses and minuses. First, educational growth has opened opportunities at all social levels, but has not led to a regime of equal opportunity that genuinely distributes social and economic outcomes on the basis of educational merit. Outcomes vary. I mean, the Nordic countries, the Netherlands, Switzerland achieve greater intergenerational social mobility than most countries. The United States does poorly there. Second, the larger higher education grows, the more resources it absorbs. In the low tax English speaking countries, universal high quality public services are not affordable, not universally. Systems are differentiated on the basis of missions, as in California, or resources and informal status, as in the UK. The Nordic countries do better because of their very large tax base but most national systems differentiate the quality of provision. Since 1960, Proposition 13, demographic changes, uneven schooling, recession and downward fiscal pressures have further differentiated public higher education in California within sectors between high and low value offering, between districts and between social and ethnic groups. The University of California is feeling pressure, but I think it's been tougher in the community colleges. This is consistent with the tendencies in higher education across the world. I mean, generalising freely, research intensive universities, the objects of global stimulation, social competition, and also policy attention in many countries, and outside the English speaking world, often the recipients of extra straight resources, face issues and are undergoing changes, but are travelling fairly well. Mass public higher education is travelling significantly less well. I'll now briefly discuss both elite and mass higher education in turn using Californian examples. First, the research intensive sector. 
all public institutions in the English-speaking world must deal with an ideological policy and fiscal climate less favourable than the 1960s. American public research universities are fraying at the edges. The weight of part-time and contingent faculty has been increasing for more than two decades. States have discovered that they can sharply cut subsidies and get away with it politically. Flagship public universities are now somewhat less competitive in hiring leading faculty. UC Berkeley will struggle against Stanford and the others unless it can raise tuition, which is currently capped, and secure more money from philanthropy. Berkeley needs more benefactors like Phoebe Apperson Hurst, who helped to build the campus a century ago. However, elite public institutions have maintained their perceived value. In fact, this has probably been enhanced by the intense competition for social advantage through higher education in this environment. In his final 2001 chapter on the uses of the university, Clark Kerr listed issues affecting the multiversity, the impact of globalization and of fluctuating American productivity, uneven rates of return to college education, the rise of for-profit competitors to non-profit higher education, the growth of mature student demand, the use of new technologies in learning, the rise of life sciences and continued unhappiness of the humanities, a partial shift in governing power to trustees and to state governors. He also noted the lessened prestige and public standing of the cities of the intellect since the 1960s when they were at the peak of public favour and influence. I think to that very prophetic list, we can add diversity politics, gender politics, the further fiscal evacuation beyond Clark Kerr's time, the rise of performance management, which I think has changed the climate inside institutions, student agency and learning, its, great, its growing importance, and intensified competition. I'll now briefly remark on four of these issues, internal governance, discipline imbalances, technologies, and student agency. Intensified competition for profits and fiscal evacuation and tuition will be discussed a bit later. Well, first then, internal governance. The managerial revolution on campus, I think, has been accomplished. Faculty will continue to share governance in a subordinate role overall. They will not manage budgets. They may have a hand on them at some point, but they won't manage them. If faculty ran universities, I think we would pay the price in delays, waste and blockages of organisational creativity. Faculty time and expertise, in my view, are best used in the knowledge specific domains for which faculty are trained. Democratic activism and public intellectualism of faculty are more usefully directed to the local, national and global public good and those political arenas than to symbolic tussling with local managers. Two caveats to that, however. First, Faculty must remain supreme in curricula and in research priorities, in research directions, research allocations. When faculty control in those areas starts to slip, the multiversity as such starts to disappear. That is a problem in some second and third tier universities, emptying out a faculty role in research decisions and in curriculum decisions. Second, university presidents, provosts and executive deans should generally come from faculty. So they understand the knowledge specific products that universities and colleges make. As Bob Clark said, the centrality of knowledge is the root cause of the many odd ways of the higher education system. And I think we can bring in some high quality external managers, but the bulk of our leaders should continue to be coming from inside. Discipline imbalances. In the strong research universities, core intellectual fields continue to flourish. In the next tier, fields such as philosophy or physics are struggling. Resource flows prioritise applied sciences and applied social sciences. Business studies evolved as a set of applied subfields such as marketing, finance and strategy, with only economics from the hard edged areas of knowledge. Some market sensitive business studies programs even downplay or eliminate economics because it's intellectually tough and it's unpopular with students. A great opportunity has been missed to develop a rigorous and transformative business studies curriculum that draws on and sustains seminal areas of knowledge such as history and economic history, which has almost disappeared in many places, um, sociology, anthropology, political science and policy studies, cultural studies and philosophy and foreign languages as preparation for global business 
That's what I think a strong business curriculum could look like. New technologies. MOOCs are a valuable adjunct to the university program and to the students' extracurricular learning life rather than a substitute for classes. MOOCs are more disruptive in mass education beyond the research university sector where they, they are being used in some places to substitute for flesh and blood teaching. In the research university sector, it's likely that the larger changes will flow not from MOOCs, but from more expensive technologies that enable students to engage in synchronous classes across distance. Student agency and learning. Now, despite the talk about student-centeredness and student engagement, words you often hear on campus, which I think reflects cultural shifts, broader cultural shifts in modern societies in favour of self-determining autonomous individuals in the workplace and careers and in consumption and cultural taste and so on. Despite, those, despite these emphases, there's been little change in the positioning of the student in learning. A superficial form of student empowerment has been facilitated by greater choice of learning units and softening of learning demands. Higher education is not a shopping mall and in many programs, high choice is inconsistent with learning coherence or rigor. Further, two successive major studies by Richard Aram and Josipa Roxa demonstrate that many students are learning little or nothing of substance in the college years. Their institutions foster a sort of happy, happy relationship based on facile instrumentalism. Says Roxa, they are told all the time that having a college degree is a ticket to a good life. They can coast their way to the finishing line and they'll, be, they'll have a good life. Students appear to be doing stunningly well while doing very little work, says Aram. The challenge is to bring deep intellectual self-formation to the centre of higher education. I'll return to this issue later. Well, what about mass education, which is travelling this well? And mass public higher education institutions in many countries rich and poor, are chronically underfunded and cannot fulfil their core missions, such as universal access in California, or vocational training for today's workforce, as in Australia and the UK. Mass higher education needs to be rethought. For example, in the Netherlands, the second sector, the HBOs, Hogschoolen, train people explicitly for local employment at a time when both skilled and unskilled labour have never been so mobile across national and um, regional borders, especially in Europe. The problems of lesser status public higher education institutions receive little attention. Governments find it too easy to cut them. In some systems, including California, the long-term future of mass public education must be in some doubt. I mean, there are trite claims that MOOCs can replace teaching. For-profits and online delivery are invested with a policy glamour that mass public higher education institutions lack though the diplomas from for-profit and online education are less valuable than from those discredited mass public higher education institutions. In 1963, Clark Kerr identified the community colleges as central institutions in an era of universal access, but he did not develop an analysis of the multi-college. In 2001, he noted that there had been a movement backward since the 1960 master plan. There were enormous discrepancies, he said, in the availability of advanced placement courses in high, uh, high schools and transfer programs in community colleges between low income and high income neighbourhoods. We see this today in the prominent role of a small group of community colleges in access to UC Berkeley, while other community colleges have low, in the state have very low transfer rates. Another and fundamental problem is that the economic and social value of a two year higher education credential has fallen since 1960. Beyond the community colleges in California lie the CSU sector. As with the other sectors, access and affordability are under pressure. As with the community colleges, transfer performance varies by region. Also, as with the CCC, the substantive mission and structuring of CSU has not changed since 1960. Though the threshold of higher education has lifted all over the world and research activity has spread to many institutions that are not really multiversities. California has 38 million people, yet PhDs are confined to UC, which is one research university site for every 3.8 million people. Now, a more normal ratio in the higher education world is one university for every one research university for every 1.1 or 1 or 2 million people. Work by John Douglas confirms the uneven quality of the economically challenged colleges and four-year public institutions and large disparities 
in access rates among ethnic and low-income groups. Studies by Ray Franke and the Georgetown University Public Policy Institute suggest that the lower participation of Hispanic and Afro-American families is wholly explained by socioeconomic disadvantage. That is, while American society and the economy are tipped against Hispanic and Afro-American families, public higher education does not discriminate further against them. Equally, however, it fails to, what, to do what many hoped it would do, and that's compensate for those prior inequalities. It falls short of the promise of equality of opportunity at the heart of the California model in two respects. It fails to nurture and promote merit in underrepresented populations at enough scale, and it no longer guarantees everyone a place. This robs the master plan of part of its rationale, further undermines the tax spend basis of the public sector, and drives families to the for profits. Now, this would not matter if for profit higher education was doing a good job and it provided value for private money and value for public money. It does none of these things. Between 2000 and 2010, for profits grew from 2.9 to 9.6% of the higher education enrolment. In Degrees of Inequality, published earlier this year, Suzanne Mettler subjects American for profit colleges to a devastating critique. For profits build student numbers with misleading claims about job prospects and transfer pathways. For profit students experience the highest average loan debt in any sector, the lowest and slowest completion rates, questionable job prospects if they do graduate, and much the highest default rates on student loans. Says Mettler, while the for profits appear to be giving struggling Americans a shot at improving their life circumstances, in reality, these schools leave many worse off to the point of financial ruin. For profits enrol one in 10 college students, but they absorb one in four of every dollars of federal student aid. Public support provides 86% of their revenue. This is uh, the market at work. Um, Mettler estimates the subsidy at 32 billion a year. So all three public sectors are under severe financial pressure. Access has been compromised. Excellence is under strain. And the fourth sector, the for-profits, wastes public money wholesale. Time for a new master plan, you might say. Um, well, let's pretend just for a moment that a new plan is possible. How might it look? Well, I think everyone has an opinion about this. But I would suggest that in the best, best ordered utopia, a master plan would cover all sectors of higher education, UC, CSU, community colleges, and the private colleges, including the for-profits. Like the 1960 master plan, it would need to progress both research intensive universities and access institutions at the same time, mobilising everyone in its support. Community colleges would move from local to state funding. See, I told you it was utopian. Um, UC would be free to increase tuition, provided that the progressive tuition and high access regimes were maintained. In the best of all worlds, tuition would be covered by the income contingent loans repaid through the tax system. I'll discuss that later. The 1960 mix of qualifications would be revisited. The higher education world has moved up since 1960. In most countries, the majority of higher education students are in three or four year programs. And in some countries, most students are in doctoral universities. Many CCC programs will be lifted to four year level, which is something already starting to happen. A second tier of research and doctoral campuses will be established in selected CSU sites. In the, long, in the lo longer term, other CSU sites would merge with community colleges, thus creating four regulated sectors again, two sets of doctoral universities, tier one, tier two, public colleges and private colleges. Bill Tierney and Brian Rodridge, Rod Rodriguez of USC suggest an overall CCC-CSU merger as part of a process of upgrading the community colleges. They also suggest that all students who graduate within four years from the CSU should be guaranteed a free college education. But any new master plan would require more public money, quite a lot more public money to make it work. In 1960, there was optimism about the broad based potentials of higher education. That optimism cannot be restored without a change in shared values and policies. At present, the political conditions are not there for more money, for long-term thinking, or for a unified public plan. Let's turn to the underlying issues then, 
the obstacles to public higher education and to its service to the state. The New Deal and post-World War II eras shaped Clark Kerr and the politics of the 1960s. Those times are long gone. The political present is led by the new plutocracy, the aristocracy of money. And there is growing economic and social inequality, sharply growing. This is associated with intense competition for high value opportunities in the leading universities, coupled with the steep stratification of institutional value within the higher education sector, which in the United States, of course, is partly sustained by the Ivy League and is largely beyond state regulation. The facts of growing inequality are widely agreed. In 2012, Joseph Stiglitz published The Price of Inequality. In the last three decades, the bottom 90% in the US have seen aggregated wages rise by 15% in real terms. That's over three decades. The top 1% have seen a gain of 150%. In the partial economic recovery, recovery in 2009-2010, the top 1% seized an amazing 93% of the total increase in US national income. Not a bad recovery, that one. Um, but most Americans are actually worse off than they were in 1997 with lower real incomes. Nor will public spending make up the gap. As Stiglitz puts it, the rich needing few public services and worried that a strong government might redistribute income, use their political influence to cut taxes and curb government spending. This leads to underestimates in infrastructure, education and technology impeding the engines of growth. In Capital in the 21st Century, published earlier this year, Thomas Piketty traces the long-term increases in economic and social inequality. And he discusses the role of higher education, especially high status universities, in reproducing inequality. States Piketty, intergenerational reproduction is lowest in the Nordic countries and highest in the United States, with Germany, France and the UK somewhere in the middle. As I mentioned before, social mobility through higher education is significantly lower in the US than in Western Europe, a, a, a far Change, a far cry from the situation a hundred years ago. Piketty suggests that this is because access to the high value institutions is more unequal in the United States, being correlated to both parental income and parental donations to Ivy League universities. He's got an amusing part about the concentration of parental donations around the time that students are, are, their student children reach the age of, uh, of, uh, of entry you know, to, the, to, to Ivy League institutions. In short, a large, part of the, a large part of the commanding heights of US higher education have been captured for the plutocratic social project of wealth formation and elite re reproduction. And it's only really the top public universities that are able to sustain a broader mission. Now we can now see that the 1960 master plan did not sufficiently challenge reproductive inequality in higher education. As Martin Trow saw it, under systemic differentiation, quote, the establishment of different sectors of higher education reflecting the status hierarchies in the larger society is an effective way of using higher education to buttress rather than undermine the class structure. But that underwrites the monopoly of the powerful in the leading universities. The master planners were strongly committed to upward mobility, but once ensconced, social elites can limit its extent. There are exceptions, poor bright students who break in, but not enough of them. Now here, the University of California does well with social mobility compared to the Ivies. Quite strikingly different in the pattern of access, but it's not large enough on its own to overturn the main national pattern. Suzanne Mettler agrees that equality of opportunity has run aground. I mean, over the, the past 30 years, she says, our system of higher education has gone from facilitating upward mobility to exacerbating social inequality. The higher education system turns over Something that, she, this is her quoting her again, something that increasingly resembles a caste system. It takes Americans who grew up in different social strata and it widens, widens the division between them and makes them more rigid. High, higher education stratifies Americans by income group rather than providing them with ladders of opportunity. It's harsh, sharp criticism. Mettler focuses not on the leading universities but on the failure of the equality project at the lower levels the financial disadvantages faced by poor families and the cul-de-sac of the for-profit sector where many have been enticed. 
She assembles strong data, the growing cost of tuition in public institutions, declining value of Pell Grants, while affluent Americans gain growing benefits from, from tuition tax policy, and the marked social differences in graduate completion rates between the social strata. The OECD Secretary General Angel Guria stated recently, education can lift people out of poverty and social exclusion, but to do so, we need to break the link between social background and educational opportunity. Clark Kerr and the 1970s Carnegie Commission understood this and were primarily focused on facilitating upward social mobility. Matters have regressed since. Mettler shows that in the United States in 2011, of persons in the top income quartile, top 25%, 71% completed college by early adulthood, and that had risen from 40% in 1970, so from 40% to 71% in 2011. In the bottom quartile, there had been an improvement. The completion rate had gone up from 6 to 10%. In the second bottom quartile, it rose from 11 to 15%. So the bottom half of the population is largely outside this process, and the top quarter is mostly inside it. It seems there is an ironbound link between social background and educational opportunity. Who cares? Like Stiglitz, Mettler describes a political system that responds to plutocracy in which leading Democrats cross the floor to join the Republicans in defence of the for-profit sector's right to exploit the poor and excluded as its own special market. And this political system also wants a higher education system in which every actor is permanently at war with every other. Intensified competition is manifest in two ways. First, social competition between students for access to the institutions that confer advantage, and we all, we all know about that. Second, institutional competition between universities as standalone firms for prestige, research output and reputation, top students, top faculty and resources. And the two forms of competition interact and reinforce each other. I said that elite reproduction and high stakes competition go together. This is not simply because a place in Harvard Law School is a doorway to wealth, a highly valuable prize, something worth striving for. It's also because those who are very rich prefer open competition rather than distribution on the basis of merit or entitlement. It can bring in, the very rich can bring their lopsided resources to bear on any contest, to win any contest. And open competition, of course, legitimates unequal social outcomes. Now, in this hyper-competitive setting, a cooperative system model like the UC is outside comprehension. But in an atmosphere of intense competition, the effects do not stop at the boundary of the elite sector. They work their way down to the middle level institutions as well. While competition can drive performance in specific areas, for example, university rankings drive universities to perform in the areas covered by the rankings, and the indicators covered by the rankings, competition absorbs resources and weakens performance in domains not related to measured competition, such as the provision of social access. There are not many rankings that are, high, that are both reputable, highly regarded, and also centrally focused on provision of public access. As competition intensifies, it demands ever higher spending from institutions just to hold their position. The salaries of enrolment managers escalate like the salaries of football coaches. Now, these patterns will not be modified by good practice in the UC system. They can only be tackled amid, amid a broad momentum for democratisation, a different mood in the country. It's likely this kind of momentum will develop. I mean, the emerging discussion about inequality is one sign of this. But this will not change higher education soon. We need to live with what we have. In the meantime, elite reproduction and high stakes competition feed into a one-sided emphasis on the private economic benefits of higher education. And there's diminished regard for the shared public benefits of higher education, which are economic, social, intellectual, cultural in nature. It's as if those public benefits don't matter, or they will flow regardless. In turn, the shift in the public-private balance of emphasis onto the private side is feeding into and is fed by the anti-tax politics and the collapse in state funding of for higher education. Now in this instrumental setting, higher education is finding, finds itself judged solely by the private rates of return associated with degrees and the employment rates for new graduates. Fruits of the human capital metaphor are discussed in the first lecture. Although Adam Smith and Alfred Marshall had a broader view 
of the benefits of education. It would take longer than we have today to expose all the fallacies in this limited idea of higher education. But briefly, first, the notion that the education-employment relationship is in lockstep progression, creates unsustainable expectations about outcomes and underplays the transition between these two very heterogeneous worlds. Higher education and work are very different sites, as different in their way as, say, state and family. Second, private earnings cannot be solely attributed to higher education, but are also affected by social background, networks, individual personality and energy, and contingency. Like employment rates, earnings are closely affected by fluctuating global, national and local economies. What pr pr proportion should be attributed to university education? It's arbitrary. Third, higher education generates many other benefits, individual and collective. In Higher Learning, Higher Benefit, published in 2009, Walter McMahon provides a summary of the literature on those broader benefits. These include health outcomes of graduate and family and better public health, more prudent personal financial management by graduates and greater economic and political stability in the country, better citizens' political participation, earlier and more widespread adaptation to technological innovations, enhanced communications, more diverse cultural activity, social tolerance of difference and so on. More broadly, we could say that higher education is a pillar of civil society in many countries. Now, calculations of these benefits are, of course, assumption dependent. Nevertheless, it's clear that in modern societies, higher education touches many of the conditions of individual development and collective sociability. Higher education institutions will produce more and better benefits of this kind if those benefits are recognised in policy, valued, observed and monitored. Only a small proportion of university places can be associated with stellar careers. A one-sided focus on private economic benefits empties out the value of mass higher education, especially in the community colleges, both lowering their fiscal standing and reducing participation and completion, and diminishes the social contributions made by the UC system. In this climate, the individual UC campuses face a dilemma. Do they compete explicitly as high brand providers of private outcomes, which they can do? Pressing the state to free them to charge tuition consistent with the value of their degrees, which is high. Diminishing their range of public service, converging with Stanford and other leading private universities and competing on that, on that turf, which they could do. Or do they persist with a broad-based public and social mission, risking continued under-recognition and underfunding? Berkeley, UCLA, UCSD are well-placed to compete on a standalone basis, but the breakup of the system would undoubtedly weaken some others. Now, there's, there's little we can do from higher education alone to alter social competition and growing inequality at the root. But we can research it and we can talk about it. And we can expect selective private universities to be more meritocratic, like leading public universities. And despite the obstacles posed by low tax spend politics, we can press for tuition policies that modify the impact of social inequality, for example, income contingent student loans. We can also tackle the narrow definition of a product, the sole focus on private economic benefits. I've got two ideas about this. I mean, the first is about student learning. I call it higher education as student self-formation. The second is about defining, observing, measuring and enhancing the public goods produced in higher education. Now, I'll now take up these three, these three themes, tuition loans, self-formation in learning and public goods in higher education. I'll start with tuition. Um, now, in many, though not all countries, the share of costs borne by family and or student is rising. Higher education remains free in the Nordic countries, almost free in Germany and France, and below the $3,000 a year mark in almost the whole of Europe. On the other hand, tuition is climbing in the United States. It's already high in the UK and Australia, and the family pays the largest share of costs in most of, each, most, most of East Asia. There, the lowest levels of tuition are paid by high-achieving students in the leading universities. They receive the best su subsidies. Uh, those students also tend to be from socially advantaged families, as in the United States. Nevertheless, knee-jerk tuition policies based solely on fee level can miss the point. The public character of higher education 
its contribution to equality of opportunity is shaped not by whether tuition is charged or by the sticker price, but by the combination of price, subsidies, exemptions, student loans and university selection policies. The ultimate determinant of the public character of UC is who gets in. Students from poor families and first generation higher education students are much better represented at Berkeley than at Stanford. According to John Douglas, both Berkeley and UCLA each have more low income students than the whole Ivy League put together. 40% of Berkeley's undergraduates pay no tuition, 65% receive some financial aid, and half graduate with no debt. And the, and the average debt of those that do graduate with debt is low. Berkeley's progressive tuition regime and UC's exclusive focus on needs-based aid are impressive to this outsider. At the same time, UC undergraduate degree completion rates are unmatched by any other public research intensive university. Now these factors would not change if Berkeley's tuition rose by 5,000 or 10,000. In fact, it's impossible to design a tuition regime that couples high charges with minimal deterrent effect and minimal socioeconomic bias. That is, a regime in which no student from any background is deterred on financial grounds. How? Income contingent tuition loans. Now, these were first introduced in Australia in 1989 and adopted by the UK, the whole national system in the UK, in 2012. Public university tuition in the UK has been fixed at a near uniform £12,000 per annum. That's about $19,200. Everyone's Almost everyone is paying that level. Students pay tuition using government-backed loans. No money actually crosses a counter. Now, these loans are not subject to timed repayment like commercial loans. They're in income contingent, meaning that they're repaid through the tax system on a percentage of income basis with repayment beginning when income reaches a threshold, minimum threshold level. In both Australia and the UK, that threshold is just below average full-time earnings. So few new graduates trigger that income threshold. Few new graduates are paying their, their tuition loan back. And the tuition loan is paid um, on the basis of taxation through the employer. So instead of being taxed at a rate of, say, 35%, you'll be taxed at a rate of 39%. Again, no money changes hands. You don't send checks to the government. Um, it's just, you just tax at a higher rate. And having been through the system, I have to tell you that you don't notice the payment process until you, and, then, and then eventually your tuition loan is gone. It's very, very painless. And the deterrent effect is minimal. Um, tuition debt is subject to sub-commercial interest rates. In Australia, it's adjusted on the basis of the cost of living, on the basis of the inflation rate. The UK has about a 1% level above that. So it slowly in increases in, 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 in money value, and in the UK, slowly increases in real value. But um, um, uh, not all graduates repay their loans over a lifetime, particularly those who spend long periods outside the workforce, for example, in family formation. Unpaid tuition debts are not passed on to your descendants after death. So the scheme is actually generous in relation to gender and it actually advantages women, many of whom will not repay in full. The scheme is government subsidised in two ways, via the rate of interest, which is subcommercial, and through non-repayment. And the extent of subsidy can be tweaked by altering the terms governing the loans, the rate at which you repay back, and of course the interest rate on debt. But in a low tax setting, in income contingent tuition loans allow the UK and Australia to expand enrolments on an open-ended basis. And both of, both of them have got demand-driven enrolments, meaning government will subsidise or will, will, will offer this scheme to any number of qualified students. There's no limit. Um, and this is in low-tax countries in both cases. But because the, the governments know that graduates will eventually pay most of it back. In the UK and Australia, the public subsidy is variously estimated between 25 and about 40%. Although, of course, until the schemes have run for 30 or 40 years, no one will know exactly what the figure is. In the best of all worlds, tuition would be free and supported from a progressive general tax system. In low taxation polities, that's not possible. And the nearest thing to collective financing and cost-free study is income contingent loans. Income contingent tuition loans have completed 25 years in Australia. The social mix in higher education is, seems to be little different to what it was when tuition was free prior to 1986. Though the system is much larger, 
partly because it's been financed by this mechanism. The most sought after universities are dominated by the affluent middle class, as before, but this is because of academic selection. I mean, financial factors are not the only factor that stratifies opportunity, obviously. Nevertheless, opportunities in Australia and the UK are less stratified than in the United States because finance has been taken out of the equation. It's very important for poor families especially. Now, only the US federal government could introduce income contingent loans, which would absorb existing commercial loans, and that would be a great cost. It is transformation almost on the scale of healthcare reform. The need for it would have to be very plain. The new scheme would confront vested interests and would be fiercely contested. But if, if implemented, it would radically weaken the link between financial, family financial circumstances and completion rates. If income contingent loans are considered, though, questions will arise. For example, should subsidised loans cover the full Ivy League sticker price? I mean, would they find themselves funding skyrocketing, skyrocketing tuition? It could be a blank check to just put the tuition up to any level. So all of that has to be managed. And of course, there's complicated state and federal transfers to sort out as well. So there are plenty of issues and it's hard to do. And when I raise it with people, I say it's not doable, but what a difference it would make if it was. And um, I guess it has been done now in two federal polities, although the UK is not much of a federation, Australia certainly is. Um, higher education is student self-formation. My second, my second suggestion. Now, earlier I said that the turn to the student-centred learning and student engagement had been superficial, mostly anyway, consisting of consumerism and softer learning demands, essentially a focus on customer satisfaction rather than transformative learning. Here the business model has reached into the heart of higher education to our cost. It's intellectual transformation that makes education truly exciting. The core problem is our inability to imagine the intellectual and personal self-transformations that many students already undergo. We need to put active and reflective students at the centre of our thinking. Rather than modelling students as semi-passive respondents, information and communication tools are ahead of higher education in many respects in positioning the student as a proactive decision maker. But disciplinary learning offers richer contents than Facebook. It's strange that after the 1960s and all that's happened since, and it's been about the autonomous student self-determining their way through life, all of it. The higher education student is still imagined primarily as a person other formed in the educational process rather than self-forming. Other formed by teachers and teaching, by learning resources, by technologies, by the institutional environment, and by external stimuli such as market signals. But I think that picture, that one-way picture of a student other formed is fundamentally misleading. As I see it, Learning in higher education, especially as you proceed further up the chain into graduate learning and to doctoral education, but even in first degrees, is an intentional and reflexive process of self-development, driven by conscious goals. Students learn to become, because they want to become something different. Often, study and university attendance are just part of a larger personal project. These personal projects include preparing for work, becoming more skilled or employable, becoming wise in the discipline, entering into a field of knowledge, embracing it, finding a preferred identity, and I think that's something which a lot of students will talk about when you ask them, and working out a future. Student volition, the will, the agency of students, is prior to the learning program and supplies the energy in every act of learning. It's the essential resource, yet we downplay it in the way we imagine higher education. As Manya Kamenchik remarks in relation to student engagement research, the starting point of this research has been that student agency is shaped by the institutions, by the structure. Agency is shaped by the structure, very simple. And the focus has been on the question of how the institutions organise and use their resources to promote various forms of engagement. Rather, Student engagement research should be focusing on the students, not the institutions, and examine not how their environment determines them, but how they appropriate, interpret, and in some cases, alter that environment. Now, once we understand higher education and student self-formation, we can organise it differently. Students need a rights framework that will provide them with the social space and time in which to make decisions for themselves. 
They need financial support, information and skills to help them develop themselves and make choices. At the same time, we need to accept that higher education is only one social site where students are forming themselves and making their future alongside work and many work while they study, consumption, communications, travel, family, friends and so on. Students should be encouraged to be active, thinking and self-reflective agents in all spheres if they're not already. But self-formation can't be programmed and it moves learning decisively away from a reduction to standardised economic objectives. Self-formation and its social meanings are determined by the student and are diverse. The notion of higher education as student self-formation creates room for many personal projects. I mean, it includes, it includes economic investment in the self as human capital. It includes formation of the self as a professional. It includes building social capital, building cultural capital. It includes also for some political activism, a process of collective self-formation. It includes acquiring aesthetic sensibility and practicing art and so on. Now, some students will opt for shallow self-formation, given the choice. Some students will prefer to graduate largely unchanged. The task of the educator is to persuade the student to invest in a deeper process of personal change, to take advantage of the opportunity, which, which, which becoming soaked in a knowledge system, a, a discipline or disciplines can provide. Finally, the public good functions of higher education. As noted, policy in many countries focuses primarily on the private benefits, the measurable private benefits of higher education, such as earnings or the social status of graduates. Rates of return and employment rates are easy to measure. However, while there is no general theory of higher education, it's clear that many of its outcomes are not captured in the form of private benefits for individuals, but are in some sense consumed jointly or indirectly. They are collective. Institutions contribute to government, industrial innovation, social equity, and the formation and reproduction of both knowledge and of relational human society in many ways. Higher education fosters tolerance and awareness of difference. The public outcomes of higher education also include individual goods associated with these public collective benefits, such as the formation in students of capabilities such as social literacy and scientific literacy, effective citizenship, connectedness, economic competence. Now, these individual capabilities will not show up in an earnings equation. So a sole focus on me measured individual economic goods leads to an impoverished picture. I'll probably convince you of that if you didn't already know it. But the problem is that public goods are little discussed. There's no agreed nomenclature. There are many loose, vague, normative claims, not very plausible rhetoric. Evidence-based approaches are underdeveloped. Social scientific approaches are underdeveloped. No discipline of can do this wholly. I mean, economics gets you some of the way, sociology gets you some of the way, psychology can get you some of the way, but none of them will do it exhaustively. Collective goods, especially, are a difficult frontier problem in social science. Because the public goods are not identified, observed or measured though, they're underfunded and they're neglected. We need to develop methods that allow us to grasp these public goods systematically and comprehensively. How do we factor in the normative element? For social goods are policy shaped and some groups benefit more from public production than others without losing the element of empirical observation which is crucial if we are to move forward here. How can we move beyond a solely economic understanding of public goods without setting aside economics which is part of the picture? How do we measure public goods while satisfying both inclusion comprehensively and rigour? In his treatise on probability, J.M. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, said the qualities that are apprehended by social science can be divided into three categories. Those open to measurement and computation, those to which a precise number cannot be assigned, but are nonetheless capable of rank ordering, you know, more or less, faster, slower, better or worse. And those that can be apprehended only in the exercise of expert judgment. Now, all three categories are relevant to understanding the public goods produced in higher education. Quantification is essential if we are to provide governments, public and institutions with greater clarity about public outputs. But it is also essential to observe and monitor aspects that cannot be easily measured or measured at all. I think this is an important project, identifying public goods in higher education, on which we can work together on a cross-country basis. The public goods produced in higher education include global public goods. 
goods produced in one national system or institution that cross borders and contribute to other systems and the countries and populations in which they are housed. Now, these global public goods include research, and especially research on worldwide problems. They include also some forms of advanced training, people who move across borders for education, and things like protocols that affect people's mobility, their global public goods in higher education. By more precisely identifying global public goods in higher education, we can design and target strategies to enhance these global goods to our common benefit. Higher education has a deep capacity to address key global problems, such as ecological and social sustainability, that neither states nor markets alone are competent to solve. In sustaining and developing the Californian model of public higher education, and more precisely identifying the public goods that it produces, including the global public goods, there is much at stake. This is the slide that best summarises the 2014 Clark Kerr lectures for me. The public multiversity in the global era. This, that is my work. This has been an engaging experience and I've learned much from you. I'm very grateful. It remains for me to thank you again and to wish you well in your work in future as you apply the principles of uh, access and excellence in higher education in synergy in the best Californian tradition. Thank you. Much to think about there. We do have time for discussion. Raise hands. And we have a traveling microphone. Our, uh, thank you so much for this presentation, a lot very thought provoking. Our uh, governor, Jerry Brown, who you may know or may have heard about, was my governor was when I was in high school, and now he's my yes. governor again. I believe he's come back again. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, I have been looking at what he has said over the years about higher education and um, partly trying to figure out uh, what, what, his, what his beef is, why, why he's so uh, uninterested in providing, in increasing funding for higher education. And I have found in various places things that make it sound like his, his he feels that the universities don't do and have not done, maybe even when he was a student here, um, your uh, self-formation aspects, the creating a really thinking independent person um, uh, and people being self more self-directed. And uh, I mean, and I think that was part of his thinking when he went out and said, let's have MOOCs. He was sort of fr so frustrated. He's like, let students figure out their own direction, give them, give them these give them these MOOCs. And that's really the only way I can um, match kind of his deep interest in, in education and learning and um, him kind of throwing this MOOC proposal out there. Anyway, the, the, you know, bringing back the research, public research institution seems to be partly, at least in this state for this governor, about figuring out how, you, how to actually make happen your uh, solution number two. Do you have ideas about how we can do that? I mean, MOOCs are an interesting, I think, paradigm for the times, aren't they? Because there's something very good about this form of uh, delivery. It brings very high quality content and at best very well designed, very communicative. It, it latches onto the way people use the internet really well. As you say, as Jerry Brown would say, it places the individual in the centre of the picture. It allows them to, as they do with cultural content in general, you know, manipulate this particular set of off offerings as they will. And the fact that MOOCs don't have high completion rates may not be a terrible thing in itself. Um, I mean, not every book you read, you read because you're going to be assessed on the basis of it at the other end. But you may learn a lot from that book. And um, we can understand MOOCs as a sort of general educational tool, a sort of form of extension education. See, one thing that, you know, if we wanted to seize on the times a bit more effectively, one thing we might do is um, 
uh, is say, oh, um, this is a great service we can provide the people of California. Uh, you know, we can, we can uh, develop um, uh, MOOC offerings in a whole range of areas that are using expertise that's in the UC system effectively uh, and are providing really interesting content for people free of charge. Um, and we can help people learn how to use it most effectively as well. And all of that can be done once you establish, once you go through the considerable expense of establishing the, the platform and the, and the particular units. You can then distribute, you know, with no extra cost to any number of people, or virtually no cost. So, so I mean, that, you know, that, in, that is a valuable new educational tool we have. Um, and I, and I, what, I like it because I think it brings rich contents much more, you know, much closer to people in a way which they can use them effectively. But the idea, of course, the problem is the either or, you know, either MOOCs or conventional delivery. I mean, clearly, MOOCs don't do what orthodox teaching and learning does and or credentialing um, in the whole range of ways in which they fall short, in fact, of being able to do those things. I and mean, the idea that you can, you can simply eliminate teaching and then expect the teaching function to somehow be captured in some other way, I think, is foolish. Um, and uh, I think the self-formation idea depends on the sustaining of the teaching function. You know, it depends on the, uh, the, the, the teaching as a resource, as a sort of mentoring function alongside students piloting their way through the world. Um, and, and once you take the teacher out of the picture, you get a radically impoverished capacity. Um, there's that, some, some, some people will be familiar with the work of Vygotsky, the great Russian uh, educationalist of the, educational psychologist of the social psychologist, of the 1920s, and, and he's been very influential in the last 20 years. I think he's been kind of revived in a way. Now, one of his arguments is that um, there's a period of, of people's lives where they're in the zone of proximal development, where, as he called it, where they can only learn effectively w when they're working with a mentor or with a, a senior person. And when they go through that stage, they can then work on their own. Now, I think that um, higher education is a what it provides is a zone of proximal development, you know, where it has these larger people resources available. Uh, and that's a richer experience than MOOCs alone can provide, even if, if you're just talking about use, use of MOOCs. So it's the either or that's the problem. I mean, I, I, I don't quite understand the biography, Jerry Brown, because I know he, 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 he was a, he's a, he's a UC student, a graduate, or, I think, or former student himself. Um, maybe he, his experiences then have shaped his view now of, of the potentials and the actualities of higher education, as is often the case with political leaders. And it's surprisingly difficult to sway people from those early impressions if once they're, once they're solidly formed. Back here. A related question to MOOCs. Uh, I would like to learn your take on about the future of open education. As you know, open education has been utilized in many developing countries and we have like mega universities uh, which yeah. has one million or two million students in India, in Iran, Thailand. in Turkey, in yeah. Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on, on the future of open education? Well, I'm sure it's part of the mix. Um, it's not a substitute for everything else. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to get away from the value of full-time attendance-based class-based education. I'm not arguing for the lecture form here, but the seminar form, I think, is quite viable. Um, and and open, open learning can't give you that. Uh, and I, I guess, though, that open learning's got more potential than it's ever had because of the potential for interactive um, uh, communications at the base of it. And I certainly had the experience of working initially in a sort of delivery-based open-ended, uh, open learning framework when I was at Monash University some years ago, and then we switched into a more interactive um, internet-based mode and that, you know, we could do far more and the students were much happier. But the funny thing was that, I remember that program very well, the, we got this overwhelming demand from the students for at least the residential weekend where they could meet each other. They really wanted to see each other's faces, I think. Because they've been talking, talking electronically and, uh, you know, you can't get away from the value that that, that, that has, I think. So as um, the student debt levels at graduation approach $30,000 here, I, I, and you were describing the income contingent loan programs such as in Australia, I'm wondering 
just the, the level of tuition here being so much higher, um, if there would be, a, what your thoughts might be, if that, that would be complicated it, by the very much higher tuition and, and debt levels. I don't know what the average debt level is in Australia. No, actually, well, it depends what we're talking about. When we're talking about the UC system, what we're talking about the IBs, or, I mean, because the, the contrast in terms of debt is enormous. Um, but but uh, Berkeley tuition is, what, 13,000? Um, roundabout is in full. The Australian levels, I don't know, averages it higher than that. Uh, the UK is near near 20. So they're on income contingent systems. Um, so, I mean, it depends. In Australia, it varies by discipline. Uh, it, the disciplines are, are, uh, are um, stratified according to both cost and the value of the degree or the perceived value of the degree in the marketplace, which is terrible because not every lawyer is highly, law graduate is highly paid for example. Um, but um, uh, income tuition loans allows you to carry high, it's actually a lazy way uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, of operating because it allows you to carry high tuition and governments tend to then withdraw their subsidies further and the tuition just goes up quite quickly in income contingent systems. We haven't really seen the ceiling of what they can charge. I think the UK and Australia will both keep going up for a bit longer. Um, the, to the point where they're now exceeding average, the actual cost of courses in some areas. So this, these income contingent systems are actually generating surplus um, and in, so, in some discipline areas, which I think is problematic. Um, so you need a sort of independent commission to run, to run, the, run these schemes to make sure they're not, they're not wasting public money. I guess the second part of that question is, what happens um, with marriages? If, if you're tying it into earnings, right. someone with a 30,000 debt level but doesn't work ever? Well, I think, you, uh, I think the individual carries the debt. Um, that's how it works. It's not transferable. Right, so if, if that person, the graduate doesn't work, they well, do they not pay. Well, they just keep their debt if they're not triggering the repayment threshold. But you're not judged according to family income, you're judged according to individual income. Let me ask a question that relates to that last one. As the income contingent loans were instituted in Australia and, uh, and in the UK, there needs to be an initial source of money to keep things going while everybody has the loan. Is it a large bond issue or what? The, some, some, yeah, the government's... Are not paying tuition directly to no, the university. That's right. So governments the provide... Government must. Is it doing it through a bond issue or how? I don't know about the bond. Governments provide direct grants, which are equivalent to uh, the money which the students are obliged to, which are, uh, that they're incurring as debt. But they've so, had to take the initial expense the government has. Yes, that's right. Governments, governments put money up front, and then students pay it back as a, as a loan. Mm -hmm. That's basically what happens. That's what I'm... I mean about public underwriting. So finding that big chunk of money. So it looks like a lot of money at the start for government, but the, but it's money which is it's, it's in a different place to the um, to recurrent expenditure on the public accounts, mm -hmm. because it's uh, it's because it's in a loan structure and and there's an expectation of repayment. But the government also has to factor in <coughs> non-repayment as part of that calculation. Mm -hmm. And the calculation of non-repayment is quite arguable, and most of the British debate is about how much is going to come back, which projections are right and whether the scheme is costing more than the old scheme or less or... Yeah. So, hands, uh, yes, here. I, Diana. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you so much for these wonderful lectures. I've learned much, as I'm sure everyone has. Uh, my questions are two. One, have these re lectures been recorded? And two, do you have plans to publish them? Thank you. Well, I think Judd can answer both questions. So. We, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm obliged to, uh, to the University of California to produce a book in which, out of the lectures, which I will, but I, and I think they've been recorded. So. Uh, they have been recorded on tape. They will be accessible through our website, Center for Studies in Higher Education, starting as of sometime in November, and uh, they uh, are also being recorded for UCTV. I always wanted yes. to be on television. Uh, so you have given us three remarkable lectures and a lot to think about. But 
I want to bring us back to the very specifics. Today, especially, has been a very high-minded lecture. Uh, you've, uh, and Judd, for example, was asking a question of where are we going to get the money. So I want to put some very specific issues on the table, especially if we're coming back to the master plan. One of them is politics. The other is students and even parents. So, I mean, it's all, I mean, what you're telling us requires a kind of revolution in our thinking, first of all a revolution in our financing because of the way you want to contribute to the students, and even a revolution in the way students come prepared to the university um, and how they can use what the university has to offer. Now, those are all very large <laughs> projects, to, to, to say the least. Um, does that mean to be, to be very specific, does that mean that that is the only way to salvage the, 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 the project that we have here in California? Mm -hmm. That is, it's only if we do these three major reconstructions, which would re require take, literally taking on the state, taking on the high school system in terms of how students are educated, and whether they come here prepared to do with what we have to offer the kind of self-formation that you're suggesting. My own experience, for example, has been that that is true for older returning students. But when I deal with an 18 or 19-year-old, mm -hmm. I frequently do not have a student who's prepared to do those things. That doesn't mean there aren't some. But uh, in general, you don't have that kind yeah, of Yes, that's a good comment, Paula. Um, I, I would say that of the three big items, uh, Tuition reform is a federal issue, uh, which would, the ground needs to be prepared, and it's not, a, not an instant issue, obviously, but if there's another administration which roughly is similar to the current one in the next, for another eight years, that probably would allow enough time to get it on the table as a possible big-scale government reform. I and mean, clearly, um, the cost of, of student debt is, is a, and, and, and the problem of access to community colleges are both issues that the that the present administration is aware of. So this, if you like the beginnings of there of the politics of, ra of getting that issue on the table and, and getting some kind of machinery discussion going. Um, but I mean, I think it's not quite as big as healthcare because uh, there's not quite as many industries and, and, and vested interests involved, but it's still, you know, I, can, I don't underestimate the problem. And of course, healthcare is not being a completed reform process at all. Uh, so yeah. Uh, um, and it's a question of how important it is in the country in the end. Uh, but it is, it is a great reform for federal government because it hits everyone at once. It's, it reaches, does so much good for so many people um, simultaneously. It's very attractive politically from that point of view. Once, it's, once people have got to, can grasp it and can run with it, they can see the benefits. So I'm hopeful, but I think that would take some time. It would take, it, it would take a, a very good paper or two early on to establish the idea. Um, but I think that's a real, within the framework of the United States, and the political system, even the plutocratic agenda that you know, but you know that we that, that, that seems to sit so hard on Congress, it is possible to get this discussion going. That that's that's, it's not big rock candy mountain stuff. It's possible. Um, the the other two, well, I think self formation is the really long term and hard one, um, uh, and I agree with you by about 18, 19 year olds. I mean, I think that the task is actually to bring them into this this role. I mean, some of them are there already, but many of them are not. Um, it's amazing how much people change, isn't it, between 18 and 20, 21, and how often what they do is determined by the evolution and change that occurs at that point of their lives and how much those patterns then become determining later on. So it's, 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 it's trying to tap into that process which they're undergoing and we're not making them do, but they do for themselves just by the process of maturation at that point. I guess it's, that's what I'm talking about. But I think it's just, it really is quite long-term and quite high-minded, but, you know, that's the high-minded one. On the question of the public benefits, um, I, I think that's a social science problem. Like, it's an intellectual problem, which we've treated as a political problem. We need to stop doing that because the rhetoric's not working. We need to start thinking about it as an intellectual problem, trying to push the boundaries and the frontiers of social science forward, and then we can go back into the political discussion later when we've got some tools, we've got some data, we've got something to work with. I think that's something we can do within social science, which I work in, you know, in the academy, in, in the university system. So 
that again is not crazy. It's just not going to pay dividends quickly. Um, I, I think tuition reform's the big practical proposal. I know, I know, I know it's large, but I think that there's a chance that that could happen here. And <clears throat> up above, uh, we need the microphone up there. Diana over here. Shall I? Yeah, shall I go first? Also? All right. Shall well, I? Do you hear me? Okay. Look, um, yes, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Margaretson, uh, for, the, for the excellent speech. I think you hit on so many points, it's difficult to, uh, to corral my, my thinking into, uh, into a focus. But uh, I think one concern I have is, is this issue of uh, self-motivated uh, learning. Uh, and I think, you know, I may be wrong, but some of the research I've done on this mm -hmm. tells me that uh, the, the kind of learning that's, that needs to be needs to be done today requires a uh, analysis, synthesis, at a, at, a, at a very abstract level. And it requires not only an intellectual involvement, it, it, it takes so much time and effort, it requires a moral involvement. Mm -hmm. And my feeling on that is when I, look, when I look at schools and I go into schools, is that it's not starting early enough. I mean, it's, I think the uh, learning the mastery of uh, autonomous, in, being an autonomous intellectual has to start about 11 years old uh, with, a, with a process that gets you, gets you up to speed by the time you're 14 and you're driving, you're, you're driving the bus by that time and you're, you're making the demands. But if you wait until you're 17 or 18 to do that, your, your background's already uh, affected you. You've you become, uh, you, you don't have the means to resist those pressures from uh, society and what have you. You, don't, you haven't learned how to be uh, self-actualizing uh, anyway. But that's, how do you do, you, do you hear any other researchers saying that there's a problem with not getting this going, uh, you know, at an earlier age? And on top of that, I think, High schools in the United States are an absolute brain destroyer, and maybe that shows up in the problem of boys, is because the emphasis, there's so much intellectual emphasis put on socialization and tribal activities that it, and I can remember even in my own case, that, uh, you know, it was, it was stiltifying. And if you weren't pretty and you weren't, you know, amazingly uh, outgoing and whatever, you know, you, you thought enormously about these problems. And the day you got through high school, it didn't matter. You know, it just completely didn't matter. So, you know, that was, a, that was an insight. Anyway, I'll stop there and let you uh, comment on that if you would. Well, I'm, I haven't got much to add because I, I, I was pretty sympathetic to what you said, but um, I accept that whenever you start talking about higher education, when you talk about first degree and students especially, you end up saying K-12, K-12, you know, that's, that's where it all, that's what matters. We've got to do, you know, the problems of higher education are dwarfed by the problems of K-12. Uh, and and the, the task of renovating teaching and learning in higher education, uh, you know, in universities with ratios that are going up over 20 and, uh, and all the other demands on us are dwarfed by the problem of, of uh, lifting the status of teaching and making making that an attractive and meaningful activity for more people of high quality. Uh, you know, that I think if we could get that right, of course, we'd be having a much more energetic and, and sophisticated discussion about universities than we do. Uh, and I don't claim to have answers there because I'm not working on school education as I did in the 80s, or, you know, early in my career. Um, but, uh, you know, we really need... If we're going to talk about the first degree, I think we have to have... Talk, talk about that first degree with school teachers in the room as part of that discussion. And we have the final question over here. Um, I wanted to ask you to comment on two aspects of education, higher education. One uh, that I would say characterizes the California model, an aspect of aspe access, which is the opportunity for going taking multiple routes to higher education, both in age and in uh, different trajectories of institutions, et cetera, and how you think that may have been changing over the time you've seen it and what prospects it has. And the second one having to do with the role of professional education and the way that it is changing and shaping in the public uh, university system. I don't think I've got Which enough data. Been going into different inst at different levels now mm. and, and the role that you think the, sort of the, the best ways that you would like to see professional education be either separate from or part of a public higher education. 
Yeah, I just don't think I know enough about the system here to answer those questions well. Uh, I mean, I, especially the, the first question about, the, about uh, different routes, except that I, I guess that I don't like one chance systems. I don't like social selection all happening at 18, 17. It worries me a lot. And um, I think, you know, alternate routes and second ways in and third ways in and, and particularly the use of um, access institutions in that regard are very attractive. Um, and we need, I think, to, uh, to think about professional education in the formal sense of, you know, the, the, the professions uh, in terms of different ways into professional training, different levels and different points because people mature in different ways and they prepare themselves in different ways for those training programs. As for professional education in the larger sense, um, I'm not sure, uh, except that um, I guess that, uh, that for, for professional education to be really effective, it needs to be lodged in terms of uh, credential bearing programs so that you know, the activities need to, the people need to have the option of banking um, their uh, shorter courses into larger qualifications and so on. And those structures need to be inventive and, uh, and, uh, uh, and handled well. But uh, honestly, I'd, the question you've asked me, and as an outsider, would require me to say, I think, to spend three or four months at least on the problem before I can answer properly. So I apologise for that. You know, what I read about wasn't that, those issues really. Although I began to read about alternate routes and, and more how the community colleges worked, so I got quite interested. We come to the end of the uh, 2014 Clark Kerr Lectures on the role of higher education in society. It has certainly been a stimulating experience for all, and I know you join me in that. Our considerable thanks to you, Simon Margins, and job well done. Thank you.